Yes, indeed. We are in the Gospel of John and uh, in the first session. And this is a strange book because it's the, it is so direct and open and simple that the, it's a great, many people recommend it as the first place to start studying your Bible. On the other hand, it's also the book that is incredibly deep and reward always rewards this, the diligent steward, uh, steward or uh, student. And uh, so they say it's shallow enough for a child to wade in, but it's deep enough that an elephant can wash in is one way it was quipped. The Gospel of John, and we're going to explore the first 14 verses of it. To give you a perspective of what we're going to do during this coming hour is that we will, of course, have some introductory remarks. But I want to indulge in some hermeneutical caveats. Hermeneutics is, the, is your theory of interpretation. Everybody has a slightly different way of viewing the text. We want to make you aware of how we view it, if for no other reason that you at least understand why we come to the views we have. And we're anxious for you to form your own views through your own study. But we're also going to highlight why did John write this gospel? He had a very specific purpose in doing so. And, uh, we'll, and we'll also take a look at how this gospel fits into the other four, the other three, the four, the four gospels. And, uh, and, uh, why, and in what ways is the gospel of John unique among the four? And uh, we'll talk, of course, we'll focus on the pre-existent one, the origin, the beginning, if you will, in a sense at least, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're also going to uh, indulge in exploring several metaphors that are too important just to gloss over. Uh, the logos and uh, phos for light. These are two words that come up so frequently and we don't want to be um, clumsy or casual with the their use. And uh, we're going to also explore something that most people are not aware of, an area called the metacosm. And so, and we have a final little surprise of something that uh, I think you'll find interesting when we co as we complete uh, this section of what we're going to be dealing with here. But getting into the introduction here, these hermeneutical presuppositions, I want to um, highlight the fact that our ministry has been based on two discoveries, and uh, the, the, the primary one being the integrity of design. We, when we take our Bible, we pick up 66 separate books, and these 66 books were penned by at least 40, maybe 44, some people have slightly different uh, reckonings, but over 40 guys that penned these that didn't even know each other for a large measure. And all of this occurred in over a period of almost 2,000 years. And so let's get that in mind. 66 separate books, 40 different authors. And what we discover is, first of all, that we have here in our possession, as we, as we pick up these 66 books, we discover that is, it is an integrated message system. I'm using that in the professional sense, in the information science sense. And that is we have 66 books, 40 different writers over a thousand years, yet every detail in those books is anticipated by deliberate design and a very skillful design. And once you discover that for yourself, you'll be confronted with a second discovery that emerges from it. And that is that that the origin of that integrated design had to come from outside the time domain, outside the dimension of time, simply because it writes history before it happens with the precision that's breathtaking. <clears throat> so those two discoveries are the cornerstone of our uh, uh, hermeneutics here. An integrated design. We believe that the New Testament will demonstrate, in fact, in the study, that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's really an integrated design, even though it com it's composed of such diverse parts. So I wanted to cover the integrity of design as one of them and its extraterrestrial origin. I also want to highlight why we make uh, such a fuss over details, because we're convinced that every detail is there deliberately by the Lord. It's, it's part of that design. And Jesus declared that, by the way. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he makes this remark. He says, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And uh, for verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht or a tittle, that's a Hebrew uh, expression that um, 
is a, a, a yot is the smallest of the 22 Hebrew letters. It's something you and I would mistake for an apostrophe or a blemish on the paper. A tittle are the little decorative hooks. The, if we take a look at Hebrew, yot is, is, is a little tiny uh, letter and the tittles are the little uh, details that accompany them. And so um, when you say one yot or one tittle, that's the equivalent of you and I saying not the dotting of an I or the crossing of the T. And when he says that, that's a call to taking the text seriously. And so we've talked about the relevance of details in broad terms. We'll see that as we go. That also has led us to a view that um, we don't see synonyms. There are two, there, two words can be synonymous in that they mean almost the same thing. But watch out for that almost because that in that overlap, they may be hiding a treasure that you could overlook. So I want to talk a moment about resolving power. You go and spend a few dollars and get a telescope and look at a star, you see a bright spot, big deal. You go and spend a lot of money and buy a really good telescope, you discover, looking at that same star, that it's actually two stars. The ability of optics to discern two things that are almost the same is called resolving power in optics, but it also is a term that you can use in language, and it's important to be sensitive to that. For example, um, uh, Ma uh, Mark, Luke, and John use a term, the kingdom of God, frequently in their in their writings, in, the, in their gospels. Matthew, and he's the only one that does this, uses a different term 33 times, the kingdom of heaven. And you pick up any of a hundred commentaries and you'll find out the expositors regard those as synonymous. That Matthew, because the, the passages seem to be pretty much the same, where they're quoted this way, that this is just a choice of Matthew. Except if you're really careful, you'll discover that Matthew also uses kingdom of God five times, but 33 times uses the other one. And what you discover is that it's Matthew's using a genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. And it turns out once you understand that, it changes the implications of the whole Gospel of Matthew. So that's an example of what I'm using. There's another example, and that has to do with the Olivet Discourse, which is recorded, of course, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, virtually identically. And most commentators, including some of our early studies also, presumed, like most people, that Luke 21, which is a very similar presentation by the Lord Jesus Christ, is part of the Olivet Discourse. And uh, now both of these writers, uh, both these accounts, uh, involve a cluster of signs that Matthew calls the beginning of sorrows. But if you study them carefully, you'll discover they're given at different times to different audiences. And uh, uh, Luke talks about things that will happen before that cluster of signs. And Matthew talks about those things that will happen after those cluster of signs. You discover the two different briefings with two totally different purposes. And so it's another example to be on your guard with this, uh, over this issue, uh, Luke talks about the, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD in great detail. And because he did, there were no Christians that fell in that disastrous siege. But uh, in Matthew 24, I have a whole different thing, and that's the desolation of Jerusalem that is yet future. And those things need to be discerned, or you'll fall into error. So, okay, we've talked about integrity design, relevance of details, absence of synonyms. In our ministry, for more than four decades, we've had a trademark verse we use, which I call the Berean Challenge, and I want to focus on that for a minute. And uh, uh, they, they, Paul and his gang, they, they went from, um, Luke records how they went from Thessalonica to Berea. And speaking of the Bereans, they said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And we've adopted that verse as our trademark verse, as I say, for four decades. But and most of, and the emphasis I've had during most of that time is focusing on searching the scriptures to prove whether things are so. I, I usually quip that this is where Luke tells you don't believe anything Chuck Misser tells you. Check it out for yourself. Our desire is not to to uh, uh, instill a specific viewpoint. We're really anxious to help you grow your own tools to come to your own conclusions. We'll share candidly what our views are and how we got there, but only as, a, as, a, as an aid, not as an assistance, if you will. And so, but we always felt that that first, the, the, the last part, the scriptures daily was the, the difficult part. 
discovered in recent years that the really difficult part is the first part. To receive the word with all readiness of mind. I've discovered in my travels that most people have trouble with the Bible because they have been mistaught about bad science. They have concepts they bring to the, the thing that are ingrained that are incorrect. And part of our challenge in discovering truth is to come at it with an open mind, to try to set aside our preconceptions and so forth, put them to the test, if you will. Shedding our erroneous presuppositions is usually the more difficult part of the two. So um, when you talk about uh, searching the scriptures, the, the word there, anacrino, is actually to prove. That you, you, you search it in the sense of investigating, to judge it, to evaluate it, and so forth. And of course, the radius of mind is the most difficult part, and that's what I want to focus on here a little bit. Now, one of the things that we also have in our background studies I just want to summarize quickly because it's going to touch upon what we're dealing with not only tonight but through our Gospel of John. And that is to realize that what we think of as our reality, a physical reality, has boundaries. That may surprise you, but those boundaries are well understood in modern day science. If I use uh, Da Vinci's Vitruvia and Man to, uh, as just uh, a, a symbol of how far man can reach, and I want to explore what's larger than he, and I'm going to let size increase to the right on this little diagram. Uh, going towards largeness, we call the macrocosm, largeness, the universe, if you will. And that plunges us into astronomy and astrophysics. The great discovery of 20th century science was the discovery that the universe is finite, not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. And that has, that's what led to the conjectures about the Big Bang and all that sort of thing, that the universe has a limit of largeness. That's a shock, but well understood today. Now, on the other hand, if we and, and the fact that it's finite, if we go the other way and look at smallness, we come to an even more amazing discovery, that there's a limit to smallness. And that plunges us into the area of quantum physics, subatomic particles, and the like. And the profound discovery of science today is the discovery that there's a limit to smallness that everything you deal with, whether it's length, mass, energy, or time, is made up of indivisible units, units that cannot be divided. And so that's why they call them quanta, if you will. And so the fact that they're indivisible units, there's a, there's a, when you stand back from this, there is a staggering discovery as you put this all together. And that, that has been the subject of many scientific articles, incidentally. And that is that there's a limit to largeness and there's a limit to smallness. In fact, the smallness is made up of indivisible units. That means that you and I find ourselves within a simulated environment. In fact, it's a digital simulation that we find ourselves in. And of course, there's some science fiction stories and stories built on that very thing where the people discover that they're, uh, in some sense, not real themselves. Anyway, the, the, so we are in a, it, it, our, what we think of a physical reality is a subset of something larger. That largerness, that, that something that's larger than large and smaller than small, is called the metacosm. This is the region within which our reality is a subset. And that is not a, a, a conjecture on my part. That was a subject of an article in Scientific American back in 2005, in June 2005. The conclusion is that our universe is but a subset of a larger reality. And uh, that blew me away because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. We need to understand that. In fact, our difficulties in trying to understand the Bible often come from our failure to fully realize what we have discovered about the reality that we're in. And so we want to deal with it. In Romans chapter 1, Paul deals with it. He says, For the invisible things of Him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's, he's using that as his argument there indeed. And so, as we go on, we're going to be talking about a lot of controversial subjects. I'm not going to tiptoe around those. I'm going to try to convey as much as we know about those subjects to you, but with the hope that you make your own decisions. And some of the things that we will talk about, different, good scholars have different views on, and we'll try to present those fairly. 
But uh, Augustine is credited with a very interesting challenge that hangs in my wife's ministry in her lobby that I, I think was very well chosen. Augustine said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, agape. There are some things that are really crucial that we, if we're going to be Christians and we're going to be faithful to our master, we do need to agree on. On the other hand, there's many things that we'll encounter where good people have different views. And in that, we want to have liberty. But in all these things, let's not lose sight of the thing that should identify all of us, and that's the love of our Lord. But let's move on here then. Okay, let's just jump. Why did John write this gospel? When you get to chapter 20, he makes, he lays it down quite clearly. He, uh, John says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That That's his goal. John's goal is that you might have life through his name. That's what this is all about. And I'm always amused when people say, Jesus never said he was God, that somebody has never cracked this Bible and clearly has no acquaintance with the Gospel of John. In fact, let's talk a little bit before we go on about how John fits in the total package. We have four Gospels. And uh, so um, Matthew, being a Jew and being a Levi, presents Jesus as the Messiah. That's his focus. That's his agenda. Mark, is really the amanuensis for Peter, uh, focuses on his servanthood. Jesus as the servant. It's an action. It's, a, it's a, like a shooting script. Luke is a doctor, a Gentile doctor. And uh, he presents Jesus' humanity, the Son of Man. John focuses on the Son of God. Those are three different focuses. We're going to see the gospel in quadraphonic, in a sense, okay? Now, when you get the first, in, in each one of these, you have a genealogy, almost everyone. Um, in, in Matthew, because he's Jewish, he starts with the first Jew, with Abraham, and he lays down the genealogy, the legal line from Abraham all the way down to Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ. Mark, because he's dealing with the servanthood, we don't worry about the pedigree of a servant. It's the one of the four that has no genealogy. But when you get to Luke, being a doctor, he starts with Adam. And he takes Adam down to Abraham, and from Abraham to um, uh, David, they're identical. But at David, uh, uh, Luke does a strange twist. He doesn't go through the first surviving son of Bathsheba, Solomon, as Matthew did. He goes through a second surviving son of David and carries that down to Mary. It's a different genealogy. It's the bloodline. And they are distinctives for a number of interesting reasons that we won't try to develop here. But uh, worth your careful study. And, of course, John is dealing with the pre-existent one. So his first few verses are what you might consider the equivalent of a genealogy of the one who's always existed. And we'll get at that shortly. And, uh, but moving on, they each have a different focus. Matthew focuses on what Jesus said as the Messiah, what he claimed, what he declared. Uh, Mark, what he did. It's a shooting script, an action-oriented thing. Uh, Luke focuses on humanity. It's in Luke we find out how he felt. And uh, we, 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 see, we really feel with him through those experiences. And uh, John focuses on his identity, who he actually was or is, I should say. And uh, so M Matthew writes to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek in the minds of many, and John, of course, to the church for many reasons. So that's one reason probably all of us, especially as believers, have a special comfort and fascination with John. The first miracle in each one of these it supports their basic, their basic uh, uh, theme. Uh, Matthew has a leopard cleanse, which is a very Jewish kind of thing. Both uh, Mark and Luke focusing to Gentiles. They have a demon being expelled. John picks a very strange thing, the water to wine, and we're going to encounter that in our next session. But uh, they also end slightly differently. Matthew ends with the resurrection. Again, a very Jewish emphasis. Mark with the ascension. Luke with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And by doing so, he sets up his sequel, Luke Volume 2, we call the Book of Acts. And John also ends with the promise of his return, his second coming, and uh, uh, of course sets up the, the uh, fifth of his books, the Book of Revelation. John wrote three epistles and the Gospel we're studying, but he also wrote an ex extraordinary visit into the metacosm 
called the book of Revelation. And for a number of reasons, it's my suspicion that the gospel that we're going to study was written after the experience at Patmos. And we'll see if we can see evidence of that as we go. But that's speculation on our part. Now, it's interesting that these four gospels, when, when we studied cherubim, these super angels in the scripture, we discovered they seem to have four faces. And these four faces seem to parallel these four gospels. We have a lion, which of course speaks of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the, the Messiah. Uh, we have the ox, which is symbolic of a beast of burden. And uh, we have uh, the man, and we have the eagle. And uh, these four faces um, constitute uh, the uh, uh, four faces of the cherubim. They also are the ensign of four of the 12 tribes, the ones that have the, the, the lead tribes in the camps of Israel. Uh, the camp of Judah and two others uh, camped east of the, of the tabernacle. Um, Ephraim and two others to the west, Reuben two others to the south, and Dan two others to the north. They, those four constituted the four camps, and those four camps also rallied around those same four faces. So as we study our Bible, we sort of see that coming up all along. So I mentioned it in passing as we go here. And so uh, with that, a couple of other things. There's... There are many, many um, miracles recorded in all the Gospels. But John simply limits himself to seven. Changing the water to wine in Cana, we'll see that in chapter 2. And healing the official son in Capernaum, in an invalid by both uh, Bethesda, feeding the 5,000 at the Sea of Galilee, walking on the water that everybody loves to talk about, uh, healing the blind man in Jerusalem, and raising Lazarus in Bethany. These seven he chose. Five of these are unique to Luke, by the way. But he chose these for reasons of his own. We'll try to sort out as we go. Something else we'll discover is that his gospel is based on seven I am declarations by Jesus Christ. He says, I am the bread of life in chapter 6. I am the light of the world in chapter 8. Uh, <coughs> I am the, uh, the door. Uh, uh, anyone that comes in any other way comes as a thief and a robber. And uh, I am the good shepherd in chapter 10. Uh, I am the resurrection of life, and uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. These are I am statements. And it may surprise you when you get to uh, into chapter 8, Jesus makes it quite clear that he claims to be the voice of the burning bush before Moses in those early chapters in Exodus. John the person, John the apostle it is, um, he, he and his brother got a nickname from the Lord Jesus Christ. Their nickname was Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And uh, both James and John, they're both sons of Zebedee. Uh, they, they picked up that nickname. Now, that should tell us something that may surprise us. For some strange reason, the Renaissance artists and others throughout literature always seem to portray John, because he's the, be the, the beloved disciple, as some kind of soft, effeminate kind of character. Uh, that's so contrary to what the text would cause us to understand. Uh, these guys were <laughs> these guys were pretty uh, fiery and destructive. Uh, zeal, uh, they were more like a thunderstorm. That was so. They were macho guys, both of them apparently. And uh, now also, James and John, along with Peter, become an inside threesome. Of the twelve, those three were favored. It's there, there's uh, several places where only those three were. They were at the Transfiguration. They were at the Olivet Discourse. They were allowed in at the raising of Jairus' daughter. Uh, they were somehow the inside three of the twelve. And uh, so for whatever it's worth. Uh, it's interesting that John himself, when Jesus was on the cross, he gives the custodianship of his mother to John the Apostle, not one of his own half-brothers, who later become, uh, by the way, they be after resurrection, they become believers. And... Uh, but the, the one that uh, Jesus assigned to his mother's care to was uh, John the Apostle. It tells you something. We also discovered John is the only one of the twelve that died a natural death. All the others became martyrs rather dramatically. But John was able to re ultimately retire in Ephesus and died a natural death apparently. And so, okay, so uh, now um, we also know that John along with Peter was a, uh, uh, very, very active in the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, they were called one of, the, uh, one of the reputed pillars of the Jerusalem church in Galatians. 
and by, by Paul and uh, the Jerusalem church was led by apostles, John, Peter, and James, the brother of Jesus, often took the initiative. We see them very, very prominent in the early church. So the outline of the book, the, the rest of this chapter, which is about John the Baptist and the call of the disciples, we're going to take off in the next session because I want to spend some time here getting started properly on some other things shortly here. Um, I want to really examine some key metaphors that are going to lurk with us through our entire Christian experience. We want to deal with those with a little more depth. And then the rest of the book later on, the next nine chapters after next session will be the book of signs. But what's interesting is the rest of the book, the following nine chapters, virtually half of the whole book is devoted to the final week of our Lord's ministry. And uh, one third of the verses in the entire book, 247 out of 879, are devoted to just one 24-hour period. So we're going to see John really zeroes in uh, from uh, chapter 12 on to that final week as we go forward here. Well, let's jump right into the text itself. And we're confronted right up front with these first few verse, two, a couple of verses that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And superficially, it sounds like a little bit of double talk. In the beginning is actually uh, before time began. We need to understand that. Now, you and I have the benefit of Einstein and some of the discoveries of 20th century science. We know that time is a physical property. Time varies with the mass acceleration and gravity. So time itself is a physical property. Before even time existed was the word, is what it's saying. And uh, see, God is outside our time domain. Eternity is not having lots of time. Eternity is being outside the time domain that we live in. The Greek really implies here, before the world was created, the, world, the word already existed, is what it's really essentially saying there. Okay. In the beginning was the word. Now here we encounter this Greek term called logos. It's a title. It's the, and it's a title that God puts even ahead of his name. We need to be sensitive to that. It's more than just a Greek term for word like a, a, a element on a list of words. It's a principal thought or concept. In fact, it's the expression or utterance of that thought. That's what's really in, in included in the logos, if you will. And uh, it's not just, uh, it can be rendered word, but that may, uh, uh, doesn't give the majesty of what it deserves here. The Greek has two other words that could uh, that identify individual words if they occur in a list or something like that. And so, this is really a, an expression, a message, a communication, or a revelation is the flavor of this. <coughs> so it's more than a metaphor. The word logos. And uh, and I'm, I'm, this is one of the reasons, because of John's use of this and this approach here, it, it convinces me that I think he had the benefit of the Patmos experience when he put this gospel together in, in his retirement days in Ephesus. My background, professional background, has been the information sciences. And it's interesting to discover that information science is now at the vanguard or at the foundation of all the other sciences. In physics, quantum mechanics, it's all an information science issue. Uh, in biology, microbiology, DNA, it's an information science issue. It fascinates me that information science has come at the lead. And it's interesting. See, the evolutionists cannot explain the origin of information. And that's, that's why the whole evolutionary thing is at this point up for grabs among thinking people these days. And so, if they're informed properly. The highest title of deity is Logos. I think it's fascinating that is as uh, information science as you can get, if you will. And the very definition of truth, I'm indebted to my wife's research. To, I really am stunned with this as a definition of truth. What is truth? Pilate so cynically asked. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. And the word was predicted in, Gen in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, and uh, the presence of Christ was the fulfillment of that. And that's when he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he will make that as we'll get into it. One of my favorite Psalms also emphasizes this, by the way. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament that shows his handiwork. As we go through the psalm, I want you to be sensitive to the information labels here. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day, and day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language 
where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone through all the earth. Their words to the, 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 the line, the communication here, uh, is a, uh, it's the word sound. It's an, it's, a, it's an audio type of thing. Some translators would say influence. The influence is going through. And their words to the end of the world. So, and we could go on, but that, I think that's very, very provocative that the highest title of Jesus Christ is the Logos, an information science term. And it's, uh, Psalm 19 speaks of the heavens, points that Jesus created everything, including the angels. Let's not lose sight of that. And he created it from nothing. And the word there is in the aorist tense, meaning it's already done at a specific time. It's completed. And uh, in Romans, Paul, in Romans 10, Paul deals with, he says, but have they not obeyed the gospel? For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, but I say, have they not heard? Yea, verily, their sound went through all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Well, getting back to the John's opening here. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. The word was with God. And uh, this preposition often conveys the sense of reciprocity. And uh, it was not merely in the presence of God, but there existed a mutual and reciprocal relationship between the two, is what that word implies. A mutual intercommunication, if you will. If you look at the first verse of the Bible, you obviously recognize the similarity with Genesis and John here. In Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if we look at that in the Hebrew, the word for God there is Elohim, which because of the I am ending, masculine verbs with an I am ending mean a plural. So the word Elohim is a plural noun. Everywhere in the, in the Old Testament where Elohim shows, it's used in, with a grammatical exception because it's a plural noun, but it's always declined as if it was singular. It's a contradiction in a sense. The word Elohim is in the plural, okay? And that's the word for God here. What makes that provocative is you need to know something about Hebrew. In Hebrew, a plural is three or more. In Hebrew, is one of those languages that has a dual as well as a plural, and a plural means three or more. And I think that's something worth knowing when you see Elohim. In a, it's already a, an echo, if you will, of the Trinity, which of course is all through the Old Testament and a study in its own right. But uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was in the beginning with God. The was there is, an, is imperfect, meaning continuous existence. Not, not coming into being, but it was continuously in existence, of course. That's consistent with the thing here. All things were made by him. When you want to know the name of the Creator, his name was Jesus. And that's very similar to what Paul declares in his letter to Colossians. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Those are ranks of angels, incidentally. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist or are held together. And that last, uh, that's often overlooked. The Greek is synesteo, which means sustained, held together, established. He not only created, he's holding it together. And there's a day when he, coming when he may say enough already. And Peter talks about that in his second letter. The writer of Hebrews points out that God who in sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the world. Here again is a testimony to that. Who being in the brightness of his glory and in the, the, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Wow. That's the way the epistle of the Hebrews opens up, and it goes up from there. Boy. Well, let's get to back to verse 6 of John 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this, he's talking here about John the Baptist. Let's not get confused. Because John himself doesn't refer to himself directly in his gospel this way. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So he makes that distinction right up front. And uh, we're talk not talking about John the Apostle here, we're talking about John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist 
was the last of the Old Testament. That's an important thing to understand, and we'll encounter that later. It's expressly designated that way in Luke 16 and Matthew 11. But he also, John the Baptist, was also the first herald of the New Testament, and that's his role here. And we're going to focus on him in our next session. But continuing here, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And so he's the light of men. This word light is something we can't um, be too casual about. We want to try to understand that. Jesus claimed to be, I am the light of the world. You can interpret that philosophically if you like, but there may be far more operative here than, uh, than that would deal with. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The darkness comprehended it not. And uh, so the term here is the eros active indicative. Darkness was not overtaken or, or extinguished the light. So l darkness here is not simply the absence of light as we might simplify it. That's not that's something much deeper going on here. Well, the Apostle John, is just to summarize what he says about all of this, is the light will invade the dominion of darkness indeed. Satan, the ruler, and his subjects will resist the light, but they will be unable to frustrate its power. The word will be victorious in spite of opposition. That's the, that's the flavor of what's going to unfold here. But I think there's another uh, issue here with light as a metaphor. That's the first quote of God in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and the third verse. Let light be is what he says. It's more than a metaphor. And uh, John here says, that, he, that was the true light which lighteth every man and cometh into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. That sounds like, so that's, so we're going to discover true light here shortly. The, uh, the, we'll see examples of the true light shortly here. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. We need to understand that. When you see the representations of Jesus hanging on the cross, let's not lose sight of that. He made the hill on which it stood. At any time, he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. No, no, it was his love for you and me that held him to that cross. We need to, we'll, go, we'll be going into all of that. Then we get to verse 11 and 12, very key verses in chapter 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And that's the great tragedy. That is the tragedy of Israel's history. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's an Old Testament term that has unique meaning, even to them that believe on his name. The Benai Elohim in the Hebrew in the Old Testament was a term used of a direct creation of God that re applied to angels, and that's why that term is used for angels all through the Old Testament. And it also applied to Adam. Adam was a direct creation. All of us are indirect. We're descendants of Adam, not direct creations of God, except here's what he's talking about. As many as received Christ, to them gave he the power to become a direct creation of God, the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So there's, what's going on here is much deeper than it may sound, and we're going to deal with all of that in depth when we get to chapter 3 of John. Nicodemus is going to open that door for us, and we're going to go and drive a truck through it, okay? So, so in the sons of God, new creations direct from God himself, okay? Which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so, and Jesus will, as I say, he'll explain, uh, expound all, all of this when we get to chapter 3 of John. And the predestination issues that lurk behind some of these we'll also deal when we get to chapter 6, chapter 10, and chapter 17. So those are, are uh, uh, thorns of another kind that we'll deal with when we get there. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Dwelt. The word is tabernacled, and the, the Holy Spirit's indulging in a pun here, and uh, that he tabernacled among us, and we beheld, that is, if we inspected his glory, the Shekinah, if you will, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, the absolute uniqueness of Jesus. The word tabernacle or dwelt is a deliberate pun here. The tabernacle was God's dwelling place with man, that portable sanctuary that they, used, they spent 40 years wandering through the wilderness with. It was temporary, it was humble deliberately, outwardly unattractive. Uh, it was the center of the camp. It was the place where the law was preserved. It was the place of sacrifice. It was the place where the priests fed, were fed and also the place of worship. 
So all these things are true of that tabernacle. They're also true of Jesus Christ who tabernacled among us. And uh, there's a deliberate pun here. And we'll retrace many of these things as we go through the, the, the scripture. If we look at the, if you uh, study the, I encourage you to study the tabernacle as it's described uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, if you approach it, all you saw is a white linen fence. It was, a, if, if you accept a foot and a half as a cubit roughly, uh, it was about 75 by 150 feet area that was circled by white linen. You could only enter it through a door, and the first thing you'd encounter was the altar of sacrifice, then the laver, and that would send, set you up for the the uh, naos itself, the, the key place that we, uh, the, the, this portable building that was the center of it. And that building had a holy place, and inside it had a holy of holies. And it, and it had a door, and it had a a menorah, uh, a set, seven, bran uh, seven branch candlestick, and the table of showbread. And then there was a small altar, a golden altar for the, of incense, which represented the prayers of the saints. And then we have the Ark of the Covenant. And don't confuse its lid. It was a separate item called the mercy seat. Two separate items. Different construction, different purposes, and so forth. In fact, the Holy Voice defined as the location of the mercy seat. And what's interesting here, of course, is that Jesus Christ made claim to be, any, he, I am the door, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life. He makes intercession for us. He identifies with each one of these pieces, if you will, uh, in our propitiation and so forth. So he's going to make those statements. We're going to lean on that as we go through the thing here. In um, John 14, we actually have an echo, if you will, of John, the first opening verses of John. Let's look at them together. In the beginning was the word, we read in verse 1, and the Word was made flesh in John 14. And the Word was with God, we discover, and the Word dwelt among us, verse 14. The Word was God and full of grace and truth. It's interesting how these orchestrate together. We're going to find that kind of thing happening all through John. John, uh, when, you look the book of, when you go through the book of Revelation, it's a highly organized choreography, if you will, of events and codes and what have you. When you go through the Gospel of John, it is that way also. It's just not as conspicuous because it reads comfortably. And it, it isn't until you study it, you begin to realize that it's a very intricate, skillful uh, design itself. But I'm haunted by a thing that came to me in the middle of one night about a year ago. Um, I believe that uh, the Lord whispered in my ear something that's haunted me since. And um, I want to deal with two metaphors here. I'll show you why. One is the logos, or the word, and the other is this force, the light. And I think they're more than metaphors. And the thing that came to me one night was metaphors reign where mysteries reside. That phrase went through my mind. I've been haunted by it for almost, about, I think, over a year now. What does that mean? What is he giving me here? And I suspect that what we, metaphors can be masquerades to hide the fact that we are that there are underlying mysteries we have yet to resolve. And so I don't want these metaphors to go casually. I want us to be sensitive to their depth before we go further. That's exactly what happened to Barry Setterfield. When he did. That's how we discovered the speed of light was slowing down. The Lord told him that one night and he followed through on it. Well, I have the same flavor of something going on. There's something here that I, I want to make sure we're diligent about. The word logos we've talked about, it's more than a metaphor. It's the, it's the title of the pre-existent one, a title he puts above his name. And uh, so the, uh, he is the creator, not just of the macrocosm, the microcosm, but of the metacosm. All else, the macrocosm, largeness and smallness, all else are subsumed by that. There's something more here. Following the fall of man, the creation has been subject to futility and bondage. We learn that from uh, Romans 8 and other places. To reveal himself more clearly, the Creator has given us his word or his logos. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's interesting when, uh, when, when, you, when speaking of the creation, David uses the word Elohim. But uh, of his personal revelation, his word, seven times David uses the covenant name, yod heh vav -Heh. Most rabbis won't pronounce it, Yahweh, some people will. Others will just spell it, yod heh vav -Heh. But anyway, the point is, here we're dealing with the word. His word is pure, we know from the scriptures. He doesn't play games. He, I mean, he doesn't mince his words. They're pure. They're reliable. And uh, he puts his word even above his name. That staggered me. When you realize how God feels about his name, that he puts the word even ahead of that, 
speaks volumes. And so, see, the creation is now under the curse. We know that from Genesis 3. But the revelation and his redemption is by his word. Now, one of the questions is, which, was, which one's more important, the creation or the redemption? Well, to answer that question, you have two ways to go. One is, how much space is devoted to it? Well, the creation, a couple of chapters in Genesis, a couple of Psalms, a couple of chapters in Isaiah, and that's, that's the bulk of it on the creation. The redemption, the revelation and redemption, boy, that's the whole book of Genesis. Certainly the whole book of Exodus. You suddenly realize the redemption occupies every book of the Bible as its primary theme. Well, another way to evaluate this is what did it cost him? The, rec rec the uh, creation, he breathed it into life in six days, didn't he? His redemption cost him his son. So I think we want to pay attention. The, and where we learn, we can learn about the creation from the creation itself. Redemption we have to learn from his word. And uh, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, Jesus declares. We'll get into that in John 14. So how do you discover God? A lot of people tell you, how do you rediscover God? How do you discover God? By learning about Jesus. That's really what we're all about. It sound, I don't want to, when you say it that way, it sounds like a Sunday school lesson. No, no, it's one of the most profound adventures of your entire life to really learn about the Lord Jesus. There's another metaphor I don't want to let go lightly, and that's the word for light, phos in the Greek. And uh, metaphors reign where mysteries reside. And this is more than a metaphor. Light is one of the continuing mysteries in physics. They still, to this day, can't decide, is it is it a wave or a particle? It has a property called non-locality, we'll touch on briefly. And it's the source of all life in a very literal sense. I want us to understand that. And I want to touch briefly on the hologram as a model because there's some things developing in, on our horizon that may cause some major perturbations in that regard. So. And I'll leave with you with a little something about the constants at the end that I think you'll find interesting. Let's talk about this paradox. Is light waves or is it particles? That duality, in 1906, J.J. Thompson got the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons, or photons for that matter, were particles. In 1937, <laughs> three decades later, his son was awarded the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons were waves. Which were they? See, this duality remains the central paradox in quantum physics. And there's now compelling evidence that quanta only manifest as particles when we are looking at them. You've got to be kidding. No, that is, the, that is the view. There's a thing called the two-slit two experiment. If I take a, 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 a source of photons and I have a slit in that thing, that slit acts as a source, and the distribution of the photons will distribute themselves um, as a typical Gaussian distribution on, on a, say, a photographic plate or what have you. Okay, no problem. Let's assume I have a, a it falls on a two-slit thing, and I'm going to plug one of the slits. I get the same, the th same thing will happen. I'll get a distribution uh, that is a Gaussian distribution. If I move this, if I plug that one and open the other one, I, I get, obviously, the same kind of thing. But what happens when I open both slits? You would expect that the two together would give me something like a squared plus j squared, two different bumps, but it turns out what actually happens requires their interaction. Because there's a term that shows up that implies that they're, each one is working with the other. The, the, the particles that are leaving the one split are aware of the other particles leaving the other slit. So they're operating cooperatively. And that's disturbing. To to, that gets to a whole property of non-locality. The world of quantum physics. They get in, when you get into this, it's a strange world. It's non-causal, non-deterministic. Everything is probabilistic in some very strange ways. Nothing is considered real. We cannot say anything about what things are doing when we are not looking at them, strangely enough. That gets into a whole... The reality is non-local. Every particle in the universe is somehow connected with every other particle in the universe. And there's a concept in physics called non-locality. And in 1964, John Stuart Bell in Geneva 
formulated a mathematical approach to try to demonstrate that called the Bell inequality. But we didn't have the technology back then to actually try that until about 1982. Three guys at the Institute of Theoretical and Applied Physics in Paris conducted a landmark experiment, the so-called two-particle experiment, where they used photons from cesium atoms with lasers and they sent them in opposite directions. To make a long story short, they switched in less time than the, than the speed of light between them. They, they demonstrated, they proved non-locality. Each proton knew what the other ones were experiencing. And that was demonstrated in the lab and has been demonstrated other ways since then. Metaphors reign where mysteries reside. See, phos or light is more than a metaphor. It's one of the continuing mysteries. And we looked at paradox, waves or particles. Let's talk about the source of life itself. Uh, the, the psalmist tells us that the, that the uh, sun is going forth from the end of heaven and the circuit to the ends of it, and nothing is hid from the heat thereof. And that's physically absolutely true. The, the sun is the source of light for the entire solar system and the source of life to the whole the entire system, including the planet Earth. And uh, so we see that when in the fall, when we see the trees fall with different colors, those different colors are, are uh, uh, evidences of photosynthesis processes that are tuned to different frequencies of light. And they become visible when, you, when they die in the fall. And so if you look at one of these leaves, you discover it's an incredibly complicated system to, do a, to translate um, light into sugar and oxygen and so forth. And uh, that's photosynthesis, which means to build light. These sugar factories produce millions of new glucose molecules per second. Most plants produce more glucose than they use and store it as starch, another heart carburet that creates food for the rest of us. Each year, photosynthesizing organisms produce about 170 billion metric tons of extra carbohydrates, about 30 metric tons for every person on the planet Earth. And so what's interesting, not only do the plants produce oxygen and sugar, but they also, that gets used by the animals, which then produce the CO2, which the plants need in order to complete the thing. We discover this whole thing is an elegant, elegant design. Again, light, photosynthesis, it's all done by light, is the source of life, obviously, on the entire planet. But let me talk about something a little differently. I want to talk about the hologram. Most of us have seen, have seen synthetic holograms, not real ones. Holography is a phenomenon you want to be at least superficially acquainted with here. And I had the opportunity to meet with them at Leith. Uh, these scientists that took the concept of the hologram and, and added the technology of a laser to create three-dimensional photography back in this laboratory in the University of Michigan back in 64. And uh, so I was involved with it because I was at Ford and what have you. But anyway, the, uh, in a superficial way. The, uh, the provocative transform of holography I want you to understand. You take a piece of film and you put a laser light on it. But you also arrange that laser light to fall on a three-dimensional object. What falls on the plate, then, is the waves that are referenced and the waves that are reflected from the three-dimensional three object. And what's recorded on the film is the interference between them. And uh, that technically is what a mathematician would call a Fourier transform of the image. When you process that film, you think you've made a mistake because it looks like just a gray film. But if you illuminate it with the laser that created it in the first place, you discover it's a window in a, into a three-dimensional space that is, has properties that are extremely provocative in many ways. And uh, so if you look through that, you see a three-dimensional uh, image that's been recorded. Let me explain what I mean. If that were me and I was wearing a necktie and you took a photograph of me with my Bible here, you would not be able to tell what necktie, what necktie I was wearing. But if it was a hologram, you could move your eye around the Bible and see a necktie. That's what I'm trying to get across. It's a three-dimensional image, not a two-dimensional representation. And so, uh, so that's a virtual image into a three-dimensional space. John 1, 9 makes reference to a true light. You see, the Bible turns out to be like a hologram. A hologram is very peculiar because if I had a hologram, I can cut a piece of it out and I haven't lost anything because I can look around the missing hole and see whatever I could see with it there. It won't be quite as sharp. Every piece of information on the hologram is distributed on the entire surface. That makes the hologram immune to jamming. 
And that's exactly what's true of the Bible. Every doctrine in the Bible is, is distributed throughout the available bandwidth. And uh, uh, that's exactly what Isaiah explains. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And uh, so it's immune to hostile jamming. You can tear a page out of your Bible and you haven't lost any critical doctrine. That's why you don't, you don't want any one-verse doctrines anyway. It turns out that the Bible is, in effect, designed in anticipation of attempts at hostile jamming, if you will. And so this is, again, an example of supernatural design, deliberate design. It's interesting, too, that if you take the hologram and look at natural light, it has no attractiveness. If you look at the Bible without the Holy Spirit, a collection of traditions or stories doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to you. When it's illuminated by the light that created it in the first place, you have an image, the image of Jesus Christ on every page, on every page. And so that's a, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The, uh, I want to talk about the fact that there's a view growing that our universe may be a very elaborate hologram. And that's a view uh, promoted by David Bohm, a protege of Einstein. He came out of the plaza of physics world in the 50s. And they went to, uh, 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 he made, distinguished himself at the uh, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in that area. And uh, so then he moved to Princeton in 47, worked with, on the Manhattan Project with Einstein and so forth. And he, he formulated this idea, along with Einstein, of, of, a, of a, uh, the implications of quantum theory. And his, he was obsessed with the fact that at the sub-quantum level, location ceases to exist. And that caused him to infer that the universe is actually some kind of super hologram. Physics caused that location not existing as a, non -lo a property called non-locality. And so many physicists today are skeptical of his ideas because they're obviously pretty old ones now. But there are some that are sympathetic to that. Roger Penrose is a creator of modern uh, black holes and so forth. Um, uh, Espanyol of uh, Paris and Brian Josephson. Uh, these guys are prominent in their field and they think that he may have something. What's come along the way is a project in Germany called the GEO 600. The goal of this project was to try to sense gravity waves, very, very small ripples in the structure of space-time. And uh, they were predicted by Einstein back in 1916, but never been observed. They're trying to find those. But they just, in doing so, they made these incredibly sensitive um, uh, interferometers. And they attempt to detect relative changes on the order of 10 to the minus 20, the size of a single atom compared to the distance of the Earth to the Sun. These things are incredible. And in trying to do this, they discovered a noise. And that mystery noise is one of the hypotheses. It may be evidence that what they've discovered is far more important than the gravity waves. They may have discovered evidence that supports the idea of a, ge a holographic universe. And uh, so that uh, that's still being explored. We don't have to spend too much time on it here, other than be just aware of it for another reason. Are we living in a holographic universe? If so, are space and time grainy as such? Are the distant galaxies only a virtual illusion? If indeed our universe is a hologram, distances in a hologram are virtual expressions, synthetic distances, if you will. So that raises all kinds of questions that are being looked at. And also implies that there may be a literal fulfillment coming of Matthew 24, 29. The stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven that are, shall be shaken. If you try to deal with that in terms of modern physics, it's confusing. And yet, if indeed we have a hologram in the first place, that makes that very easily, literally, to come true. One last thing, and we'll call it an evening. I want to throw in just a footnote here you might find provocative from all of this. I want to talk about the constants of the universe. It turns out there are two constants in our universe that are dimensionless because they're ratios. They have no units. One of these you're very familiar with, and that's pi, the, re the relationship between the diameter and the circumference of a circle. We've all experienced that when we were in school with geometry, pi. There's another dimensionless constant that you probably haven't been familiar with unless you've been in advanced math or in engineering, what have you. It's the base of natural logarithms called E. These two are dimensionless constants of the universe. Okay, 
It turns out there are two fundamental verses in the Bible about creation. Obviously, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the earth. We talked about that. The other one, of course, is the one we opened this study with, John 1.1. Let's take a look at this, something very unusual. If we take Genesis 1.1 in the Hebrew, now Hebrew and Greek are unique in that every member of the alphabet has a numerical value. And you can play with those if you like. It turns out that in the Hebrew, it goes, obviously, remember now it goes from right to left. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. Uh, 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 countries that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Not, not only Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Arabic, Sanskrit, what have you. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Uh, not only English, Latin, uh, Cyrillic, uh, what have you, go from left to right. Anyway, Hebrew, of course, goes from right to left. Now, if you take the number of letters times the product of the letters, divide that by the number of words and the product of the words, you discover that you get pi to four decimal places. That's staggering. Just a coincidence, probably. Four decimal places is a, is a bit precise to make it too casual. And uh, so you say, okay, so what, that's, a, that's an oddity, who knows? Fine, and so that's pi. All right. Something you need to know, John Napier was a mathematician in the 16th, 17th century. He happened to be an active uh, reform uh, in the Reformation, what have you. He's the guy that discovered logarithms in the first place. That's why natural logarithms are called Napierian logarithms, and so for what it's worth. And he used decimal point and fractions and so forth. The E, if you, if you, in, in mathematics, is a very strange number for some reasons I won't bore you with mathematically. But it has a limiting value about 2.718281828285 and on it goes. Um, it forms the base of natural logarithms. It has, it, it, sure, it turns out that it, it's the only one that has a function of the rate of growth equal to its own size. In the language of calculus, it's the only function that has it's a derivative equal to itself. So that gives us some peculiar properties that makes it show up all through mathematics. And we find it in wave mechanics. We find it in electrical theory. We find it in advanced math in a lot of ways. We find it in the distribution of prime numbers. We find it's defined by a limit that uh, we don't have to get into here. And it, but it has a numerical value. If you've been in advanced calculus or engineering, you've run into E a lot, just almost as much as a high school student runs into pi. Okay. Now, if you go to the New Testament and take John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God, and you take that in the Greek, and you do exactly what we did to Genesis 1.1 1, 1 in the Hebrew, by the way, by now you've recognized Logos probably in the Greek, um, if you, if you um, take the Greek and do exactly what we did in, in the Old Testament, take the number of letters times the product of letters, divide it by the number of words, divide it by the product, uh, times the product of the words, if we go through that, we get E to four decimal places. That's a precision that would seem to reject any possibility of it being a good guess and this was something that was discovered in, by, in the 17th century. It is in the New Testament thousands of years earlier. So that's, uh, that's provocative, I think, interesting. Now the point is that if the constants are changing and we find out they are, now these are ratios that they don't change, but other things are changing. That indicates our reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. We need to keep that in the back of our minds as we encounter God revealing to us a truth that goes beyond our own immediate experience. And that's what, this, that's, that's what the Bible has said all along in Hebrews 11.3 and 1 Corinthians 15 and elsewhere. Okay, for our next session, um, I'd like you to prepare for next time by studying John the whole chapter. We've covered the first 14 verses. It's the, next, it's the rest of the chapter we'll be dealing with next time. You can also prepare by reading, if you have time, um, a couple of other passages that we'll be touching on. Matthew 17, which is the transfiguration. That will lurk behind much of what we're studying throughout John. And uh, also Revelation 11, which has these, this strange career of two witnesses. And we'll be touching a little bit on that next time also. And so with that, let's close with a standing word of prayer.